Welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video we begin our consideration of the topic of mind, starting with the hard problem. There is a growing acknowledgement that the problem of consciousness is a hard problem in the sense that the standard methods of science provide no traction in dealing with it. Thus the range of application of scientific laws may be limited when it comes to the mind. Why might this be so? The answer becomes pretty obvious when we reflect upon it. As we have seen in previous videos, knowledge results from an interaction between knowing subjects and a known object. In doing natural science, we don't care about the knowing subjects, we care about the objects in nature. As a result, we fix on them and abstract away both the experiential interactions and the knowing subjects. As a result, we have objective, observer-independent data on the objects of our interest, namely the objects in nature. However, when we turn to the mind, which is the core of human subjectivity, we have no data, because our method has been specifically designed to filter out subjective data. In other words, because the scientific method has been designed to be objective, which is a good thing in dealing with the objects of nature, it filters out data on subjectivity, which is the very thing that we are trying to study when we are considering the mind. That is why consciousness is a hard problem for the current scientific method. Cognitive science is the only science I know where the fundamental model is inadequate to half the data. Why? because while cognitive science has a good and improving model of brain function and neural data processing, it has no model whatsoever for our awareness of the data the brain does process. Instead of a model, we have the promise of a model. This is a promise that goes back to Thomas Hobbes in the 1600s and has yet to be fulfilled. It is the promise that sometime in the future, or perhaps in the end times of the naturalist faith, science will develop a model where brain function results in awareness. Yet, as David Chalmers has pointed out, not only is there no model, there is no progress toward a model. So isn't it better to have a provisional model which accounts for all of the data than a model that accounts for half the data and an unfulfilled promise to account for the other half of the data at some time unspecified? What would such a model look like? Daniel Dennett, a leading naturalist philosopher of mind, tells us in his deceptively entitled book, Consciousness Explained. In it, he presents a model, which he calls the Cartesian Theater, which has all of the right components for a model of mind, but unfortunately does not work. Still, we can use his model to point out the elements required by a real model, and also as a metaphor. To explain our experience, we need data processing to bring the contents into a form that can be presented to consciousness. This is represented by the screen and speakers in the Cartesian theater. But we need something more. It is not enough just to put the information on the screen. We also need to be aware of the information that's on the screen. This is represented by the little man in the chair called the homunculus. The problem is that putting a little man in a chair doesn't really solve anything because the little man has a head and inside the head we need to repeat the entire model over again and so on ad infinitum. So the model doesn't work. Still, it captures the two basic elements revealed by subjective experience. We have content and we have awareness of content. Any model of mind must represent both. But the naturalist model can only explain content and the processing of content. Naturalists haven't the faintest idea of how to represent awareness other than the homunculus which leads to an infinite regress. In a long, reasoned, and careful analysis, Dennett shows that no naturalist model can represent the elements present in experience. He therefore concludes that we must reject experience. Of course, this is exactly the opposite of the scientific method. The scientific method takes hypotheses and compares them to experience. If they don't agree, the hypothesis is rejected and the experience is retained. Dennett's hypothesis is naturalism, which used to be called materialism, and he values it above any data. He would rather hold on to naturalism than respect the data of experience. 
As a scientist, I've been trained to value data above theory. And so, if the data does not agree with naturalism, we have no choice but to consider naturalism falsified and reject it. That does not mean that I reject the findings of neuroscience. On the contrary, I value them. Rather, after a careful consideration of Dennett's analysis, I have come to the conclusion that naturalism is unable to model human experience. In addition to the findings of neuroscience, our model needs additional elements to account for awareness and intentionality. This leads to a two-subsystem theory of mind. In order to account for the two elements of thought, we need a data processing subsystem, which is the brain, and an intentional subsystem, which is responsible for awareness and committed intentionality. Neurophysiology, and to some extent artificial intelligence, use objective methods to study our data processing subsystem. Introspection, on the other hand, uses a subjective method to study our intentional subsystem. Only by considering both kinds of data is there any possibility of an adequate model of mind. Similarly, the two-subsystem mind mirrors the two poles in the subject-object relationship of knowing. The objective contents we know are encoded in the brain, while the intentional subsystem is at the core of our subjectivity. We have a mind in which neurons and astrocytes process data, and in which our intentional subsystem is aware of a subset of the processed contents. Why is it only aware of a subset? I do not know, but it is an empirical fact that we are not aware of most of the processing the brain does. Here we need a bridging hypothesis, which neuroscience is slowly building. The function of the bridging hypothesis is to specify what kind of neural processing makes contents available to awareness. One possibility, which has been falsified, is the shared workspace hypothesis. The idea that there is one place in the brain where all the data comes together, like Dennett's Cartesian theater. Brain scans, however, show that there is no single region activated in consciousness of all types of contents. Our awareness, or agent intellect, to use Aristotle's term, is the input side of the intentional subsystem. Our will is the executive and output side. It chooses, directing our awareness to various objects. We become aware of what attracts our attention. The will, of course, is the aspect of our mind which commits to one possibility among many in making our choices. Next time we will consider the mind-body problem and I will discuss how the will is able to control human behavior.